the adjutant has asked the commanders of the uh, American forces and the Crown forces to report their daily report, how many men they have fit for duty and how many are not fit for duty and so on. As we look at the American formation, you'll notice that on the far left of the formation, two men in red waistcoats, members of the 5th Virginia Regiment. 5th Virginia did not serve here in the West, they served in the East, and uh, their service there was very appreciated. Uh, but they represent the 5th Virginia, and they are part of the American line. Next, you'll notice there is a Native American uh, who is attached to the 8th Pennsylvania. Uh, while the troops were here at Fort Lawrence, they relied upon the Delaware, the friendly Delaware in the area to keep them informed of what was going on uh, beyond the walls of the fort so that the uh, men here at Fort Lawrence were not unaware of any friendly or hostile Indian activities in the area. The commander of the Northwest Department, Bob Carnes, colonel of the brigade, moves to the front of the formation and speaks with the adjutant who turns the formation over to him. The troops come to the shoulder as a form of salute and then return their weapons to the order position on their right side, uh, a position of some degree of comfort. The colonel will now instruct the men in what he uh, plans for the day and any changes that might have been made from an, any earlier plans. Continuing with the 8th PA, you'll notice a variety of clothing on the men. Uh, many of them are wearing a blue wool regimental coat with red cuffs and collars and lapels. Uh, that is what would be the standard regimental coat for the 8th Pennsylvania. Beyond that, their waistcoat worn underneath the coat and the breeches or trousers or overalls uh, you see a wide variety of wear from waist down among the members of the 8th PA. Some men wearing breeches, probably made of wool, possibly of linen, also of leather for extreme durability, or trousers which have a tapered leg and go from the waist down over the leg and taper to the ankle area where they end. Kind of a forerunner of what's going to be common in the period of the War of 1812. And we see a British enlisted man trying to sneak into ranks as quietly as possible, running late. You always had it. You always had it. And in the army, he would have probably been called to the front and then would have been assigned some particularly unpleasant duty because he was late getting to formation. Probably much like the U.S. Army and all the others today. You're late, you're in trouble. Colonel Carnes is now instructing the 8th PA specifically on details he wants them to be aware of. Other than those men in blue regimental coats with red facings, you see a few men wearing cloth garments, uh, one kind of a creamish shade and one a brownish shade, sand shade if you will, uh, called hunting shirts or hunting frocks or a workman's shirt in some cases. And it all depended on how they were cut and how they went on. If they slipped over their head 
they were of one style if they buttoned or tied in the front they were of a different style a different category of garment you'll notice that all the troops have with them a cartridge box and in most cases it is slung across their body from their left shoulder on to their right hip and that is where the cartridges were stored for loading and firing their weapon and the cartridge box would have been filled with paper tubes uh, approximately a half an inch in diameter filled with black powder and with a musket ball in the bottom of the tube tied in place. Some of the men you'll notice have two belts across their shoulders, one from the right shoulder to the or left shoulder to the right hip, some going the opposite direction, right shoulder to left hip, and they might be carrying their bayonet on a sling in uh, a holding device on their left hip, or they might be holding a tomahawk in that uh, same device. Here at Fort Lawrence, normal duty would have been first thing in the morning to probably gather water for the day. There was a very active spring that was north and west of the fort. It still is there. It doesn't produce the kind of water that it did then. Uh, we know that in the early days of the village of Bolivar, it was still an active producer of good spring water. But as construction happens, as the ground surfaces are changed, it affects what's under the ground also. We see that the Crown forces have been dismissed under the command of Colonel Walsh Richardson, members of the Coldstream Guards Grenadier Company, members of the 23rd Regiment, and members of the 64th Regiment with a German um, auxiliary attached to the formation in the green coat with the green cap on his head. There were no Germans stationed here in the West during the American Revolution. The 23rd was not stationed here in the West, nor was the Coldstream Guard Regiment. They were all stationed in the East. The one British regiment that was stationed here is not present today at our event, and that was the 8th Regiment of Foot. They were garrisoned at Fort Michilimackinac, at Fort Detroit or Fort Lernol, and at Fort Niagara. Uh, they furnished most of the troops in the Great Lakes region during much of the American Revolution. What the British did is they rotated troops in and out. They found that stationed in uh, undesirable locations, as the Great Lakes region was, uh, it quickly wore the troops out, and so they would be relieved, and another regiment from the east would be sent west and distributed among the posts in the west, and the 8th would have been moved to the east for eastern duty. Colonel Richardson is now instructing the troops on what he intends to do in the line of any morning drilling. So, the troops here at Fort Lawrence gather water first thing in the morning, uh, possibly uh, get the fires started for any cooking that is to be done that day, possibly some baking. Meanwhile, on the uh, area that would have been the fort parade ground in the center of the fort, the members of the 8th Pennsylvania are being drilled by <laughs> Lieutenant Fort, who is the uh, inspector for the Northwest Department of the Brigade. <coughs> You'll notice that the drummer behind the troops is wearing a red coat faced blue. In the 18th century, in both the British and the American armies, regular regiments had their musicians wear the reverse colors of what the troops wore. So if the men, the musket men in the 8th Pennsylvania Regiment wore a blue coat with red facings, 
the drummer or the fifer would wear a red coat with blue facings, which made him easily distinguishable to whoever was in command of a formation of men. And if he wanted to find the drummer for the drummer to beat a signal to the troops, that's how signals were most often given by the beat of the drum rather than yelling. A drum can be heard over a much greater distance than a person can normally yell and be clearly heard. So being in a red coat faced blue, he was easily distinguishable in a group of American soldiers milling around someplace. Now, if you'll turn around, you'll notice that the uh, British troops are doing several things. One, a new recruit is uh, being indoctrinated into how to uh, maneuver his musket in various formations under various commands. And Sergeant Lucas, on your left as you look at them, is instructing the enlisted man on proper handling of his musket. Another thing that would have happened here at Fort Lawrence first thing in the morning is there would have been a uh, return turned in by each unit that was stationed here at the time saying how many men were in good health, how many men were fit for duty, and how many men were not in good health, unable to perform their duty. Either they had been injured or they were sick and uh, were confined to the barracks to be uh, hopefully recovering from any illness that they had. Meanwhile, Colonel Richardson is doing some instruction of his own. Uh, two men who, well, one man has evidently shown a lack of proficiency in the evolution of the musket in terms of where it is held and how it is held when various commands are given. So he's having another man instruct him on the proper handling of his musket. Cartridge boxes were inevitably worn on the right hip, uh, typical of armies of many periods. They're all right-handers. Left-handers are not catered to. Uh, it just didn't happen. So the cartridge box is on the right hip, and with the right hand, a cartridge would be removed from the box, brought up to the face, the top torn off, the powder poured down the bore, and then the musket ball shoved in the barrel behind the powder, and with the ramrod pushed all the way to the end, to the breech end. You'll notice that the sergeant from the 23rd wears on his left hip a short sword called a hanger. Uh, it's shorter than a normal sword that a gentleman would wear or an officer would carry and it has a wider blade. It was meant for use uh, if the fighting became close in, close fighting, it was a uh, very handy weapon. It would have been edged so that it could be used in combat. On the left hip of the private from the 23rd, you'll notice he has a white bag called a 
Haversack, uh, coming from a German word. The Haversack was where a enlisted man would store his plate that he ate from, a drinking vessel if he could afford to have one or had uh, found a way to borrow one from somebody on a long-term basis, stole it in other words. Uh, it was an essential item. And when on the march, they would have carried the haversack as a way of containing their food supplies and their eating utensils. Here at Fort Lawrence, they probably did not use them because they would have been fed in the fort at the times that they were assigned by the officers so there would have been no need for them to be carrying a haversack with them with food and utensils in it. The 23rd Regiment is a regiment of fusiliers. They wear a bearskin cap similar to what the Grenadiers wore, only not quite as tall. And it designates them as one of three special regiments in the British Army. The 5th, or the Royal Fusiliers, the 7th, or the Royal North British Fusiliers, and the 23rd the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. The Fusiliers were originally troops whose job it was to guard the artillery trains and the gunpowder that the army carried with them on the move. And the fusil, Fusilier's cap, like I said, is approximately the shape of a grenadier's cap, only slightly shorter, and there is no grenade device on the back of it, so there is no confusion who is a grenadier and who is a Fusilier. But on the back would be a device in the center of the red plush, the badge of the Prince of Wales, the coronet and three feathers, indicating that at one time the 23rd Regiment was known as the Prince of Wales' own regiment of Welsh Fusiliers. And so uh, that is a device indicating their heritage and their lengthy service, formed in 1689. In addition to the hanger on the left hip of the sergeant, you notice around his waist he wear, wears a red uh, sash uh, indicating he is a sergeant with a blue stripe in it, indicating he's a sergeant in a royal regiment. The blue facings on the coat, blue stripe on the sash around his waist. As a sergeant in the British Army or the American Army, they would have been the person that the enlisted men dealt with the most. The officers gave the commands to the, uh, the non-commissioned officers, the sergeants and the corporals, and they in turn saw to it that the enlisted men, the privates, carried out those orders. And so it is the sergeant who becomes the, uh, the bane the pain in the backside of any enlisted soldier because he's the one that made sure that the soldier was doing what he was told to be doing. of the Coldstream Guards Regiment, that is the same Coldstream Guards that exist today. When you visit London or see on the evening news the troops uh, standing guard at Buckingham Palace, they are often in red coats with black bearskin, black fur, uh, caps on their heads, 
They could be members of the Coldstream Guards, or the Grenadier Guards, or the Scots Guards, or the Irish Guards, or the Welsh Guards. They all take turns doing Royal Guard duty at Buckingham Palace and other important government locations in London. But the Coldstream Guards, when they came to America, realized that the bearskin cap was going to be um, to their disadvantage in terms of the kind of fighting that went on here in America. And so the bearskin caps were laid aside and they were issued uh, cocked hats which were cut down to be more of a cap. A flap in the front, a flap in the back, which they could let down to protect their eyes from the sun or the back of their head. Um, it was a very practical head garment as opposed to the bearskin cap which is a whole lot less practical uh, as any of the guards in the British Army uh, would tell you today. You'll notice on the shoulder of the coat of Colonel Richardson he has an area of blue wool and white uh, cloth stripes on it. That is called a wing, and it indicates that he is a member of the Grenadier Company. Uh, they had these wings. They were uh, simply a carryover from many, 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 many years earlier in the British Army that the Grenadiers were equipped with these devices on their coats to distinguish them from the other troops. You'll notice that the Coldstream Guards wears the uh, overalls uh, or trousers that have been tightened uh, on the lower leg to fit snugly, much more practical than breeches and uh, leggings were in the 18th century. And many of the troops will uh, lay aside their breeches and adopt overalls made out of a heavy canvas material because they lasted longer and they were more durable when they were operating in the field. The colonel has the troops practicing a maneuver called rest on your arms reversed. Uh, at one time, it was considered a sign of surrender to put the muzzle of your gun on the ground. And uh, obviously be in a very much a non-firing position. It was also used in the case of funerals or public mourning. Troops would be ordered to stand on their arms reversed. The musket brought from the shoulder out and turned around so that the muzzle end of the barrel was on the ground or on the toe of their shoe, so it's not down in the dirt, uh, as a sign of mourning. And there are several paintings of British troops in the 18th century in this position during funerals of rather high-ranking officials in the British Army. As I had mentioned earlier, 
The date of the American Revolution came into existence at the end of the Civil War centennial in this country, 1961-1965, uh, because we realized that the 200th anniversary of the American Revolution would soon be upon us, and uh, many people wanted to be a part of recreating what that would be like, the life and times of the soldier of the Continental Army, of the British Army, of the French armies, of the Germanic armies that served here in America. And uh, today the brigade is probably most prevalent in the East, where it started. They are based at New Windsor Cantonment in New York uh, State on the Hudson River north of New York City. That is their base of operation, but they do performances wherever they have a request for them to come and be part of a performance or a show going on. Just like the Northwest Department here in the old Northwest Territory, we go where we are asked to come and perform, such as here at Fort Lawrence. Later this year, we will be down at Schoenbrunn Village, down in New Philadelphia, Ohio. Later this summer, we will be at Fort Miggs up in Maumee, Ohio, near Toledo. Uh, we also will be down in Wheeling, West Virginia, uh, performing there. Uh, the brigade goes where we are requested to be if arrangements can be made and if we are free at that time. The brigade is made up of people representing the British Army, the American Army, the French Army, the German Army, the Loyalist, those colonists who didn't want independence, those colonists who wanted to be part of